I want to talk a little bit about how I discovered this paper, you know, have some personal anecdotes. Um, I did my uh, PhD in, in York in the United Kingdom. And uh, York's an interesting town. It's actually quite small. It's in the north of England. Um, it's very, very old. Um, and it, one thing that's kind of special about York is that it still has its medieval walls. And, um, you know, originally they were built to keep out Scottish people. Um, but actually, you know, it, it kind of makes York feel very, like, calm and safe, right? Because you're always within these big walls. And uh, it's not like a, that much of a bustling town. Um, the pace is kind of relaxed, which I really like. And, and what that means is, you know, you don't feel guilty for taking the time to really think about things. Like, like what about the natural numbers? And <laughs> Uh, the person who wrote this paper, Colin Runciman, he was my advisor during my PhD. Um, and he, uh, he wrote this paper in 1989. So uh, as, as it was mentioned, exactly 30 years ago. Also uh, the year Taylor Swift was born. Um, <laughs> so 1989, huge year for modern life. Um, <laughs> and so the, the natural numbers, really, you know, what, what are they, right? Well. If you ask a mathematician, they might draw this and say that's what this is, just a set of natural numbers. Uh, for most people, they kind of know it as integers but without negative values, which is fair. Um, but really, what about them, right? Why, why are we talking about the natural numbers? They've been around for a long time. <laughs> and I'm here in 2019, and I'm saying you should really consider them. Um, Okay, so here's a quote from the paper. This is actually how the paper starts. You know, some 30 years into the history of machine-independent programming language design, the treatment of numbers is still problematic. That's a hip word, right? We say problematic all the time these days. Uh, but Colin was using it 30 years ago. And um, I, think, I think this quote is interesting for a few reasons. So for one reason, it's kind of weird to think about how uh, machine-independent programming languages was you know, a thing someone had to come up with. And when this paper was written, it only been around for 30 years. They were still kind of figuring it out. Uh, and a lot of ideas were still yet to be discovered. Um, but interestingly, uh, I, we're here 30 years later, and the numbers in our programming languages are still problematic. So um, I, you know, that's me, I said that. Um, <laughs> so, Let's really make sure we think about this. OK, so if you, if you walk out of this room and you mostly think, uh, wow, that guy's really excited about the natural numbers, that's a fair takeaway. But what, what's my hope that you take away? right? And I, what I want you to walk away with is that the numbers we use in our programs should relate to the structures we're using in our programs. right? So for some domains, uh, the reals may be the appropriate number system. right? Um, you know, if you're doing physics or something like that and you're dealing with volume or speed or mass, then, then the reals or some approximation of them is the appropriate number system. I don't, I don't think you should use the natural numbers for that. Um, and, and for many problems, integers are appropriate. Um, so for example, uh, you may decide we have a fixed domain, like in digital signal processing, and you may say, actually, if we represent all of our possible spaces as a 16-bit integer, uh, we know what our error is, we know what the noise floor is, and so you've decided up front this is the appropriate representation for our domain. Uh, and then, of course, what else could integers be used for? Um, maybe your bank account balance. Uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, but they can go negative. Uh, so really, you should go to your bank and say, what about the natural numbers? <laughs> OK. <clears throat> so well, what's the main thesis uh, of this paper? It's uh, for many of the discrete structures involved in day-to-day -day practice of programming, the natural numbers are the most appropriate number system. So what are these discrete structures he's talking about? He's talking about uh, graphs. He's talking about trees. He's talking about lists things like that, are kind of bread and butter for, for structures. Um, and he's saying, even though the natural numbers most closely relate to those structures, we're not using them, which is odd. Uh, and so how am I going to give you this takeaway, right? So we're going to think about the natural numbers. We're going to talk about the natural numbers. 
And in that process, we'll develop a small API of arithmetic and some other functions. And we'll see how by being very careful about the number system we chose, it kind of forces us to make certain decisions or pushes us towards decisions in our API design just by the choice that we're going to say, uh, no, we really want these to be natural numbers. OK, so what are our goals? Uh, I, I want to convince you that the natural numbers are good and proper. And maybe a, as a bonus, I'll convince you that laziness is nice. But that's, I, I admit, that's a long shot. Um, and I want to demonstrate that even simple choices in APIs, like using a NAT instead of an int, have profound consequences. Um, there's this kind of mantra up on, you know, up on Twitter these days. Make illegal states unrepresentable or make invalid states unrepresentable. With a show of hums, how many people have heard that before? Right, yeah. And often when people talk about it, they're like, oh, if you use this fancy type system feature, you can make sure that this invariant is held. And then even though you want to gouge your eyes out for looking at all the type system stuff, <laughs> at, least, at least you know x. Well, and, and that's probably true. I work, I work at Gawa. That's this one here. And we use that stuff a lot. And I always, my eyes bleed constantly. It's my doctor's very concerned. And, <laughs> but even just picking natural numbers, right? This, it doesn't get much simpler. That can make certain illegal states unrepresentable, right? OK. So now, really, really, really what I want is that you ask this question all the time. What about the natural numbers? OK, so I, I want to give you a little path, because I, I tend to meander. So in order to keep myself honest and so that you know if I'm going way off the rails, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the natural numbers themselves. right? We're going to talk about programming with NAT, which are not the natural numbers, but some representation of the natural numbers. Um, we're going to talk about doing arithmetic with NAT and some of the properties we may care about. We're going to talk about uh, how the choice of NAT influences the design of an API. And we're going to talk about implementation concerns, because it turns out some, someone has to implement these things that semanticists dream up of. You know. uh, and then we're going to talk about how does this extend beyond that. I'll just show one quick example of that. And then we're going to conclude. And you'll all either clap because I'm finally done or because you liked it, one or the other. But definitely clap. OK. <laughs> all right, so let's start. Let's talk about the natural numbers. There's a few definitions of the natural numbers. right? Uh, and if you've taken like a, a theory of computation course or if you're really into Wikipedia, you might have uh, seen that there's some set theoretic definitions. And there's these things called the piano axioms or pino axioms. I don't know how you say it. I apologize. Um, I should have looked that up. OK, so um, let's look at set theoretic definitions first. So um, uh, there's a few. Uh, but one of the more common ones was proposed by von Neumann. And it goes kind of like this. It says 0 is the empty set. Ooh, you all say, wow, OK. And then uh, you make the next number by taking the previous number and doing a set union with the previous number inside another set. OK, that's weird. Um, and then you just keep doing this. But I'm kind of cheating here, because I'm using, I'm using the syntactic kind of Arabic numerals, but then I'm also talking about sets. So what's this look like if we're actually like looking at the sets? Oh my gosh, OK. Um, all right, we don't like that. OK, so, <laughs> all right, so instead of setting yourself up for success, let's set yourself up for success. And, um, uh, and so in, in, in 1889, which was 100 years before Collins' paper, right? So really, it's kind of like a double anniversary if you really don't think about it very much. Um, <laughs> and there are many axioms that were proposed. Uh, but the two we care about it is their axioms. So we, we get to declare what's true about the world. That's what's nice about axioms. Um, and we say 0 is a natural number. We're just saying that. You don't have to agree with it. We're saying it. And then we're saying that if you give me any natural number, any, I can put an S in front of it, and I've got another natural number. And you can do nothing to stop me. <laughs> That's what these axioms are saying. OK? Um, so fair enough. This may be a little less eye bleedy than the set one, right? Uh, I think so, at least. Um, so those are the natural numbers. But really, we want to, I keep talking about the practice of programming. And I'm here talking about sets, or I've got an upside down A. 
like what the heck's going on? Okay, so let's, let's represent the natural numbers as a data type. Now this isn't a language that exists, this is my idealized functional programming in the style of Jose, um, that if I ever put my money where my mouth is, I'd implement it, but I can put it on slides and force you to read it. So what this is saying is that NAT has two constructors. One of them is Z. Uh, my wife's Canadian, so I have to say Z. Um, and the other constructor is suck, which takes a natural number and returns a natural number. Right? Those are the, my two constructors. And this kind of looks like those axioms, right? We're saying uh, Z is a natural number. You don't have to do anything to it. And if you give me a natural number, I can wrap suck around it, and that's another natural number. OK. Oh. <laughs> hmm. All right. So now, using that data type, we can represent any natural number we'd like. Now, why am I saying that? I, I, I want to be careful, you know, because if you, if you take enough programming language theory or you go through the onslaught that is a PhD, you have to be very careful with these semanticists. And, uh, you know, what, what I'm trying to say is that the data type I just defined is not the natural numbers. It's a representation of the natural numbers. But we can show the correspondence. So these fancy brackets, oh my. OK. These fancy brackets, they're called Oxford brackets, and they just mean the meaning of. right? So when you wrap around something, it's the meaning of that thing. Now, what's interesting about Oxford is it's a place where they have a comma and a bracket named after them. Um, if I were on their marketing team, I'd really push that. So the meaning of Z is 0, the natural number. right? And the meaning of the successor constructor over some value is whatever the meaning of that value is, plus 1. right? Fair enough, OK. So now I've convinced you that we can represent any natural number we want with this data type. Um, uh, the talk's over, thank you. Um, OK, no, no, no. Yeah, thank you, thank you, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, the ergonomics really suck on this one, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so to represent 3, you have to have that. And then even just looking at this, my wrists start burning, right? Um, <laughs> This is not nice, right? This is not what we would like programming. So what do we do for other data structures, right? There's a lot of data structures that would be very infeasible to type out in their full form. Um, so how do we solve that? Well, we solve it with this, you know, this notion of syntactic sugar, right, to make something a little sweeter. Um, so lists are a good example. Here's, here's the definition of um, polymorphic lists in my idealized language. Uh, you have the empty list. Uh, which is a list, and then you have the cons operator, uh, which takes some element, takes another list, and gives you a list, right? Straightforward. But it's the same exact problem. Even though we like lists, and, and functional programmers can talk all day about lists and their trade-offs and what's good and what's bad, um, you often see things like, oh, a string is just a list of characters. Oh, isn't that so elegant? Look at us. We're very clever. Uh, and then you go, and you're like, oh, let me uh, make a string. And actually, true story. I was going to do uh, PLWC for conf, and I just got so tired of typing that I stopped it right at uh, PWL. Um, OK, so this was such a big problem that really early on, uh, uh, compiler writers were like, OK, that's just not feasible. Let's have some syntactic sugar. right? So you can write a string with double quotes, and the compiler for you translates it into this list con structure. And it does that without any loss of information, right? You, you know exactly how it's going to do it, and you can still pattern match. And furthermore, uh, if you're in a language like Haskell, you can have this fancy range notation uh, where you can say, oh, I want a list that has all the numbers 1, 2, 3. And again, I was like, originally I was going to do like 10, because who does 1 to 3? That's like, but then I got tired of typing the other thing. So, um, so this is why syntactic sugar is nice. Um, so, of course, we can do syntactic sugar for the natural numbers, right? We don't have to be writing all these sucks or zeds or whatever. Um, we can just say that the Arabic numeral 3, the compiler makes it this natural structure, right? Fair enough. Look, let's put more work on the compiler writers, right? They say they like it, so... Okay. All right, so we lose nothing. We get to write in this syntactic sugar that's nice and ergonomic, but we still get the reasoning power of the list is a cons recursive construct structure, 
right? So it's win-win. Um, so let's talk about the usage just to really drive the point home. So you can say something like, is the length of x's less than or equal to 5? And that 5 can be a nat, right? And you can then, at the same time, write these nice pattern matching definitions where you're forced to deal with all the constructors and really reason about the meaning of your functions. Right? To me, this is a big win. There's a lot of talk about what's functional programming. Oh, did you know that the hylomorphism with the higher order functor thing is really fancy? I, like, I hate all that crap. Right? So really, to me, the big win is algebraic data types, higher order functions, and pattern matching. Right? That's, oh, ooh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, <laughs> That's right. Uh, I may be fired, but, you know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, so I love that this is win-win. We get the syntactic sugar, we don't have to break our wrists, but at the same time we get this nice pattern matching. Okay, so I've convinced you that just because we're using this recursive data structure doesn't mean we have to uh, get RSI. Um, okay, now let's talk about arithmetic. All right, so this is where like, you know, buckle up folks. We're talking about, we're talking about some functions here. Okay, so a lot of programmers, for some reason, uh, expect arithmetic to be uh, useful on their numbers. And in particular, I think a lot of people would complain if you didn't have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, right? Um, so uh, when programming with discrete structures, uh, we want a correspondence between the number system we're using and the structures we're reasoning about, right? And the reason I bring this up now when we're about to talk about arithmetic is because this is the core idea. The claim is that the natural numbers correspond to the structures we care about. So when we're designing the API for our arithmetic, we should make sure that we hold that correspondence, right? That's, that's the core of this talk. Um, so think for example, array indices, or the size of some structure, right? The size of a map, or the size of some set. Um, what would a negative size mean, right? That's a ludicrous proposition. And what language would ever do that? Oh, um, so this comes from the Haskell prelude, and I feel very comfortable making fun of Haskell here, um, because I'm on the Haskell committee, so it's like kind of my fault, I don't know. But um, here, you ask for the length of some finite structure, and it returns an integer. Come on. Colin's been talking about this for 30 years. Why isn't anyone listening? So, so think about how many APIs you've used that return ints, right? And how many of those are just using the negative numbers to signal errors, right? So, you know, by, by word of hum? Yeah, I know. It makes me sad, too. Yeah. <laughs> OK. All right, so now. We know we want this correspondence. We know we don't want negative values. So let's think a little bit. What do we want out of our arithmetic? And one thing we may conclude, or two things actually, is we want them to be total, and we want them to be closed. If you don't know what those mean, that's OK. I'll explain. Um, but basically, these two in combination mean that whenever we operate on two natural numbers, we get a natural number back. And it's with those two properties, right? Um, this isn't true for all of arithmetic over every number system, but that's okay. What's weird is that some languages fail even where it should be true, right? So a function being total tells us that for any valid inputs, you get a valid output. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, throw an exception or halt or anything like that. And for a function to be closed, means that the result values lie in the same number system as their arguments, when we're talking about arithmetic and num number functions. Um, so let's, let's go back to Colin. He's the reason we're talking all about all this. The aim, of, the aim is a total closed system of arithmetic with results that can be safely interpreted in the context of the discrete structures in general programming. Right? That's what we're going for. So back to arithmetic. Addition and multiplication. Not a problem. They're very easy. You add two numbers, and because you can't have negative numbers, it's only going to be another positive number, right? Multiplication, repeated addition, again, no problem. But what about subtraction, right? This is the big hiccup that whenever I rant about the natural numbers, most people don't invite me to talk about it a year later. Most people are like, but have you thought about subtraction? Um, <laughs> so. 
we can do saturating subtraction. And this isn't always the right call, but the claim is for the discrete structures we care about, it is the right call. Now, I like this operator because it looks like a really nervous person hanging upside down. Um, <laughs> so, saturating subtraction just means you never go below zero. If what would normally turn into a negative number, you just stay at zero. So a lot of languages don't have this, right? They'll, they'll underflow, or they'll just cast to an integer, or they'll do all sorts of things, but they won't saturate. And the claim here is that for the discrete structures we care about, saturation is the right call. Okay? So let's think about, let's make that correspondence concrete, right? So in a lot of functional languages, you have this function called drop, uh, that works over lists, and you have some list, and you say drop the first n elements, right? And here's a definition, you know, using the natural numbers. So if we're trying to drop zero from a list, you just return the list, makes sense. Um, if you're trying to drop anything from an empty list, okay, well, it's, the result's an empty list. And if you're trying to drop some number greater than zero from some list that isn't empty, well, then you just drop that element and keep going, right? Makes sense, we all agree. So here's, here's, a, here's a correspondence made concrete, right? What we're saying by agreeing to saturating subtraction is that we think this property, that the length of dropping n from a list should be equal to taking the length of the list and then subtracting n from that number, right? I see some heads nodding. These are the sorts of properties that we use when we're programming all the time. Right? We may not make them implicitly. We're not all proving theorems about our code all the time, as much as I know you all wish you were. But, <laughs> but often you still use properties like this when you're thinking about, is it correct for me to refactor this in this way? Right? And so by having saturating subtraction over the naturals when dealing with discrete structures, this property is one you can have in your tool belt. Or toolbox, whatever. Not everyone wears belts. Um, okay. So. Uh, what about division? I said subtraction and division were the issues. Okay, subtraction, I've convinced you all. What about division? Well, what's interesting about division is that it's already closed over, over natural numbers, it, where it's defined, right? And what I mean by that is there's the divide by zero problem. Yes, this is a, this is a deep problem. Uh, it's so, it's uh, so deep that some mathematicians say natural numbers start from one, right? And what if we did that? Um, well, let's think about that. It would solve the divide by zero problem, so it's tempting. Um, but then we lose the correspondence with data structures, right? So again, this is why we really want to think about what are we representing with a number system and constantly use that when we're designing our APIs, right? So quick digression. Why is zero important? It's because zero is not nothing. And this is a subtle point. The, like the abstraction that is zero wasn't always with us in civilization. Someone had to come up with it. And here's an example. If I don't take a class, my grade in it is nothing. But I am very capable of getting a zero when I take a class. <laughs> I have done that. OK. So Runciman proposes two solutions. One is to view division as slicing. And the other uses lazy nets. So I know when we get to lazy nets, it's going to be in the more controversial part of the talk. Um, so let's delay that a little longer. So <laughs> if we think of dividing x by y as cutting x into y places, what would that give us? OK. Well, let's imagine into existence some uh, primitive operation that a compiler writer will define that is the division we know and love, which is if you pass it a 0, it'll, it'll blow up your computer. OK. We can still get total division using that as a primitive. And here's how. Um, you just add 1 to whatever you divide by. I know. You're all very impressed. And you say, wait a second. Uh, well, why are you doing this? Well, you get one intuitive property, which is if you tried slicing something zero times, you get the original thing back, right? It only costs you that it's wrong at every other number. <laughs> Um, which maybe isn't ideal. You know, it depends. It, to each their own. So we can, get, we can get back the correct thing by using our saturating subtraction 
right? So this, this division with the dots around it, we'll call that like natural division or slicing division. And what we're claiming is, well, slicing division is using this division we just defined in terms of a primitive where we subtract one from, from the divisor. Now, if you, you know, so if it was zero, but we're using saturating subtraction, it'll stay at zero, and then we add one into it the other way, okay. And if it was one, we go to zero, and then we add one, um, okay. All right, and now you're thinking, you're a coward. <laughs> you coward. You were telling us that the natural numbers were all beautiful and pretty, and you just hand-waved away the problem, and I, you're right, and I, I have to confess. Um, so, if you think I'm being lazy, wait till I teach you about laziness. Okay, so... Here's the other solution, which is let's have our numbers be lazy. Now, who's familiar with laziness? Yeah, some? Okay. Lazy data structures are data structures where you don't compute the parts that aren't needed by the rest of your program. Uh, the only kind of well-known lazy language is Haskell. Before, there's a few others. Uh, there's Clean, there's Miranda. Um, there was lazy ML in the 80s, but Haskell's the big one. Um, Colin is a big advocate for laziness. Um, but one of the nice things about laziness is we can have infinite structures. So if we can have infinite structures, uh, why not have infinite naturals? And this would be, in a lazy language, this is a completely valid definition of infinity, right? It doesn't matter how much you try to traverse down this structure, it'll always create more. Now, you may say, but Jose, memory is finite. Uh, and I would say, well, why are you doing functional programming? OK. Um, <laughs> OK. So now we can do division in, lazy, in a lazy way. But this way, we can say, if you're dividing by 0, it's infinity. And that's OK. This will still terminate. That's fine. Um, and otherwise, you can just divide the normal way. And you may say, OK, well, that kind of looks like some weird exceptional value. I don't know if I really like it. What are you up to, Jose? And actually, we can define it this way. We don't have to use any, any special primitive functions. right? So here we're saying if, uh, if x is less than y, uh, then the result is 0, right? because we're talking about slicing. And otherwise, it's a repeated subtraction. Right? That's kind of what division is. And if you'll notice here, if you're dividing by 0, this would result in infinity. And we haven't cheated. We haven't used some silly primitive function that the compiler has to write. These are just using our you know, uh, saturating subtraction and recursion, of course. Um, OK, fair enough. What about the power, like taking something to the power, exponentiation? That's what they call it. Um, so what's interesting is that it's not closed over the integers. And for this reason, Haskell has like three exponent operators. Uh, the original definition of Pascal didn't even try. They had no exponent operator. Um, it's not closed over the integers because if you have an integer and you provide it with a negative exponent, what's that mean? Right? Yeah. So, but over the naturals, it is, it is closed. Right? And we can, we can show it right here. If, if, you, if you take something to the zeroth power, it results in 1. And otherwise, it's just repeated multiplication, nice and simple, no problems. OK, so I, I understand that laziness is controversial. Um, not everyone's a huge fan of it. Not trying to start a war here. However, I will, I will do some plugs for laziness, right? Um, these infinite values that we can only get with the laziness uh, let you avoid the cheating that's often found when you're doing when you're doing some algorithms. For example, how many of you have seen something like this before? Right? Or I, I won't make you raise your hands, but just think to yourself in, in your head, how many of you have done something like this before? Right? And often, like you, you think of Dijkstra's algorithm where you need to like set some upper bound before you start an inter iteration, and you're like, well, I doubt it'll ever get this much. So you just like hard code a value. <laughs> And you know you kind of like you know you push and your message doesn't say anything about it and you know okay, so but with with lazy with lazy nats you can actually it is actually infinite right, um, and then if I were to ask you are there more than ten people in your company or at your workplace or in your family, um, do you count them all, right, so. 
what if it was really expensive to count them all? And you still wanted to ask this question. With strict natural numbers, you would have to do all of the counting and then say, oh yes, 25 million is bigger than 10, yes. <laughs> so lazy numbers let us compare the sizes of things without even fully computing the sizes of things because you only go as far as you need to know to know is it bigger than 10? Once you get to 11, yeah. It doesn't matter how big it is. Okay, so that's mostly all I'm gonna say about laziness, mostly. Okay, so how else does NAT influence API design? We talked about arithmetic. Hopefully I've convinced you those decisions weren't completely bonkers. Um, but let's do things that aren't arithmetic, right? So, um, the size of a structure, very straightforward. So let's do a list, and this is exactly what you would think, right? If it's the empty list, the size is zero, and if it's not the empty list, you just do successor to the size of the rest of the list, right? Very straightforward, no controversy. Okay, what about position? So the position function or index function is you take some structure and I give you a value and I wanna know at what position in the structure is that value, if it's there at all. Right, so wh what, what type should this return? Well, I won't make anyone answer. Let's, let's, let's unpack it a little. Let's do some of it. So let's, let's define position in terms of a helper function, an auxiliary function called uh, POS, <laughs> whatever that means. And, <laughs> and what we're gonna say is, it, we're gonna start off at zero, right? And what we're gonna do is say, okay, if, if the element we're looking at right now is equal to the element we're searching for, then whatever number of our iteration we're at, that's our position, right? Makes sense. Um, and otherwise, if it's not equal, we recurse um, and then we increment our counter, right? But um, what if we reach the end of the list, right? So in implementations I know of, the result here is negative one and the type returned is integer. But we're saying we're not gonna do that, right? We can't, so what are our options? Anyone wanna shout out an option? Yeah, <laughs> okay. The person who said option was listening more carefully. Um, so you can say that it returns an option of a natural number. Right, and then we change the code so that if we do reach the element we're looking for, the result is some n, where n is our current count, and if we don't, the result is none, because zero is not nothing, right? Uh, but there's, a, there's another one, and, and actually Colin in his paper didn't suggest this one, right? So we like this because we have to be explicit about the possibility of failure. No one consuming this API can ignore it and say, oh, well, I got back a number, let me add it, or whatever, they, you can't do that. They have to reckon with the fact that this could have failed. Um, but he, here's a different approach, and the reason Colin prefers this approach is because of laziness, right? So, so here's positions. Instead of returning an option of a NAT, you just return a list of all the places where that element occurred, right? And of course, if it didn't occur in the list, you just get the empty list back. So you still have to reckon with that failure. And if you're in a lazy language, you only compute as much of this as you need. So if you only ever need the first occurrence, you don't end up even recursing the whole way through the list. All right, ooh, very nice, ooh, okay. Um, so in a lazy language, positions are strictly more flexible. Um, and what this shows is that we have to mind the gap, right? So when it returned integer, we as a consumer of this API had to think about what if it went wrong, I need to check it if it's less the negative one. But we removed that gap. There's no values in the return type that aren't valid results of the computation we care about, right? So there was no gap, right? When you're using integers, but only the positive values are valid results of the actual computation, you have this big gap, like literally half of your possible results. But here we made it so that we couldn't do anything because zero isn't nothing. Right, and every other number is a valid result. So we had to think of something else. The choice of the number system forced us to be explicit about the possibility of failure. Okay, what about sublist, right? So sublist, you have some big list and you're like, oh, I want the list that represents the elements from five to 10, for example. 
Anyone see a problem with this? Okay, that's fine. So sublist has some invariance, right? And I, I didn't give it a type on purpose because in some languages, uh, this function assumes that uh, n is uh, greater than m minus 1. And the reason is because if it's not, um, you would have passed take a negative argument. Now you may say, but well, that's ludicrous. Why would take accept negative values? And I would say, ask the Haskell designers. Um, <laughs> So in our sublist, the fix is very straightforward. If it's zero, right, we only have to care about two possible things for the first natural number, whether it's zero or non-zero. And if it's zero, then it's just take, right, because we want everything from the beginning of the list. And otherwise, if there's a successor, we drop that number of elements from the list, and then we take the remaining with our saturating sub uh, subtraction. And this gives us the behavior we want. If we ask for the range five to 10, but the list only has eight elements, we get the range five to eight. Oh. Comcast is very eager. Uh, they are a sponsor, so. <laughs> <coughs> so what about implementation concerns? So uh, a lot of people get pretty riled up when I describe the natural numbers in this way, because they say something like, uh, you know, why don't you see nats everywhere? And I say, oh, language designers don't care about them because they're meanies. Um, and then the language designers say, that's not fair. We actually just have performance concerns. And I'm like, um, what do you mean? Um, even languages that do have them, I'll put that in scare quotes, end up tripping over themselves. So here's, here's a true story in three pictures. Um, so anyone know about size and then signed size? Because that's the world we live in. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Right, so here's a true story in, in three photos. Um, okay. Then we have this. Oh, by the way, I, I saved this screenshot as love.png. Um, and this person's saying, actually, ints are the problem because most of the values we care about, negative numbers have no meaning. You know, I'm kind of paraphrasing. And I, I felt a warm, gushy feeling of deep sympathy and love for this person. I've never met them. I have no idea who they are, but they're my favorite person. Um, and then the person who originally filed the ticket responded with this and said, yeah, that's all nice and warm and fuzzy, but actually there's places all over the code base where we're mixing unsigned and signed ints with our arithmetic expressions. And there's these automated casts. And, when I try to get rid of the warnings, because who pays attention to warnings, um, we get wrong results. So, some of, like, there may be people in the audience who use this software, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to point names, because that person isn't, isn't wrong, right? Reasoning about the behavior of casts, especially implicit ones, is difficult. They're not wrong for wanting to avoid it, right? So is, is all hope lost? Well. In most languages, part of the problem is that unsigned values can be coerced away, right? So you don't, you don't have to reckon with zero, right? And what we, we want a reckoning, folks. That's what we want. OK. <laughs> so some languages do it right. In particular, uh, Idris and Agda both compile um, these NATs that I've described to machine words. They used unsigned integers. Now what that means is they don't have the lazy, nice, infinite values. But you know, a, a machine word is pretty big, and it can take a long time to reach its max. Um, <clears throat> but there are still remain issues with implementing lazy nets, right? And in particular, the issue um, is really bad memory usage. This has plagued lazy functional programming for decades. Um, uh, so what are the alternatives? Uh, we can use a machine number, like they do in strict languages. Um, we can use unevaluated computation all the time, right? We call these thunks. Um, or, and this is what Colin recommends in his paper, he says, uh, the implementer can do fancy things behind the scenes so that you have this nice lazy semantics, but whenever you actually use it, you collapse it down to a machine integer, and what you carry around is a pair of machine integer and unevaluated lazy net. Right? So whenever you learn some more about how big your value is, you collapse it down so you're not using all that memory, you have that value, and the full value is the sum. Right? So you can still have infinity, but you might know it's definitely five, so you store five as a machine word. 
oh, that's, that's nice. Um, oh, I kind of gave it all away. I got ahead of myself. So, so why don't we use machine words? I think it's suitable for eager languages because you wouldn't be able to have infinite structures anyway. Um, uh, but we lose infinity in lazy languages if we represent it as a machine word. Why not thunks? Well, this is why, because uh, they use a lot of space, right? Um, so this is what Colin recommended, as I just described. And, and what's, what wasn't addressed in the paper, what was left as future work is, you can use all sorts of nice static analyses to help you determine when you don't need it to be a lazy number, right? It's possible that your program never uses the fact that it's lazy. And in fact, part of my PhD was this analysis called strictness analysis, which uh, in a lazy language can tell you, actually, these values have to be defined. They're not going to be lazy. And so if you know that all your uses of numbers are strict, why not represent them as a machine, uh, machine word? Um, so, and then all those dirty implementation techniques are hidden from the user, right? As far as the user is concerned, there's Z and there's suck, and that's all they have to worry about. Um, OK, so what about beyond NAT, right? Now, I'm aware that most of you aren't going to go home and write nat.js and uh, <laughs> make sure that everyone uses nat. Uh, I get it. So, so what's really the point, right? Um, so what about sets, right? So here, here's a thing we see all the time. Uh, we have some a API we're using, and it returns a list. What's that saying? Right? What's a list say? Right. Does the order matter, though? I don't know. And there's all, there could also be duplicates in a list. Does that matter? It may matter. It may not matter. But the type hasn't told you anything, right? Um, and so again, we, we recall that mind the gap, right? So uh, if the same function returned a set, it would be signaling something, right? It would say there's no order here. And it would say there's, you don't have to worry about duplicates, right? And so. Every data structure we choose in our API is signaling something. And what we want as API designers is that that something is as close as possible to our intent. Right? So asking the consumer of your API to ignore a signal from the data structure they're consuming is adding to their cognitive burden. Right? You've given them a list, but then you say, don't worry about the order. But it's ordered. And you're asking them to just trust that they don't have to worry about that. Right? So we want structures that are necessary and sufficient no more. Right? That way, all the signals they get from the type we're giving them are things they can worry about and no more. So some closing thoughts. Um, in case you haven't picked up on it, I really like the natural numbers. Um, I encourage you to think about the natural numbers. Uh, the next time you're designing an API, uh, I, I do this all the time where I'm writing something and I use int because it's just what's available and nats aren't in my standard library. And I go, oh, but is that what I mean? Uh, and you know, I have admittedly different problems than most people, but that's a problem I have. Um, and what's interesting is that no one, when I talk about this, no one seems to disagree with me. Very few people are like, you're wrong. How dare you say more types or whatever? And yet, we don't see Nats, right? Haskell, which ostensibly cares about this sort of thing, it's not in the prelude. It's not in the, the set of types you get when you load up uh, the Haskell REPL. It's not there. So I have, there's, this, there's this dissonance between everyone seems to be like, ah, oh, yes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, good job, Colin, well done. And then no one uses them. Hmm. Mm hmm. That's right. Something to think about. OK, so here's the last thing I'll leave with, which uh, I really like this quote, because it was so optimistic. And I, you know, I care for Colin very deeply. Um, but in 1989, you know, he's claiming in his paper, he goes, oh, yeah, we all know laziness is clearly superior. You know, some people may not think so, but we'll show them. And I love that kind of optimism. There, there was this uh, era of lazy functional programming where it was just like, 25 people in the world, and they were like, this is the way to do programming. And they felt really radical. And they're like, we're going to redo everything, and we've got infinite structures. And, um, and, and now there's people saying, you know, Haskell's great and all, but what if it was strict? Which is like, oh. Um, yeah. So I, I find that well, quick, sorry, I know I tend to meander. But like, 
isn't that really frustrating? Like, there's one lazy language for the people who want that. And then people are like, let's take away the one place they can be lazy, you know? Like, <laughs> come on, leave us one place to be lazy. But, you know, all right. So, and remember, uh, Taylor Swift was born uh, that same year. Um, so smash that subscribe button. You can find me on Twitter, at uh, Jose Calderon. Uh, and remember, the natural numbers. Thank you.